Well, for those of you who uh, are just new with us and don't know what in the world is going on, what is the deal with that crazy video, we're going through a series called Seriously, where we are looking at some Christian myths, and we look at these crazy videos to make us laugh, another reason for us to say, seriously. If you didn't recognize those three kids that were on that video, those uh, three kids are the children of my good friend Kelly, who lives in Mississippi, and um, I sent his uh, wife, Jenny, a, a request, a text her, I said, hey, Get your kids to say seriously, and so she sent those uh, to me today. So I, um, I love those kids, and um, even though they're not part of us, they are in a certain kind of way because that, uh, they're part of my family. Um, th- this week was unusual. We, um, last week was unusual as well. This week was unusual for me because I was out of town two days. On t- uh, Tuesday, I left. I was actually out of town more like almost three days. I, I left out of town on Tuesday and-, and went up to Richmond, Kentucky. There was a, a-, a, dis- a discipleship conference that I wanted to be a part of there. Uh, to kind of help me understand and see what other churches have done with their discipleship and kind of how they've uh, made these kind of things work. And so it made my week kind of short on the front end. Um, I was only in the office Monday, all day Monday, and then uh, part of the day Tuesday and left about lunchtime on Tuesday and, and didn't get back until late Thursday night, and so I came in Friday. Uh, so what I ended up doing is I, I um, worked my message as, as best I could on Monday and Tuesday, Monday and the first part of Tuesday. Um, and that's good and bad. That's like, a, you know, if you've got a project at work that you have done at a certain date um, and you get it done a week ahead of time, you feel like a relief, right? You know, so I didn't have to, Thursday didn't roll around and I'm still kind of thinking about, you know, how are we going to finish this up? Right? I was already done. It's good, right? It's not being procrastination. It's kind of good. There's some bad sides to that as well because sometimes there are things that uh, when, you, when you write something down and you kind of work everything out um, and then something happens and you want to you kind of address that, but you can't without totally redoing everything, and that happened this week. It happened last week a little bit uh, with the uh, shootings in South Carolina, which was such a huge news story, rightfully so, and we got to talk about that and address that a little bit last week. This week, as you know, um, something big happened in our country. Um, They found Bigfoot. No, I'm just kidding. That was just a joke. They did not find Bigfoot. That was just a joke. No, the Supreme Court, as you know, uh, ruled on gay marriage, and and they found that uh, it is... It is unconstitutional to uh, disallow. I don't even know if that's exactly what happened. It's constitutional. There's a constitutional right uh, in our country to, to, um, for men and of the, or a man or a woman to marry someone of the same sex. Most of you have all heard this. Nod that you've all, everybody's heard this, right? Um, the, the, the reason that I'm talking about that now is because, I, like I said, I, I wrote my message on Monday and Tuesday, and it has nothing, there's, there was no way. I thought, how can I fit a little bit of that into that and kind of talk about that and address that a little bit. And there's just no way to do that. And so I want to just real quickly uh, say a few things because I know some of you probably are looking to the church. How how is the church going to respond to this? Uh, What is the, you know, what kind of does SEC think? What does Jonathan think? What are the elders saying? Um, And and so I wanted to kind of address that uh, a little bit before we get started. Uh, And then um, it's going to be like a a rough transition. There's no way to do it well, but I'll just kind of start into the message. So hopefully you guys, I'm going to take a quick right turn. Just hold on, okay? Um, As you know, the Supreme Court ruled in the way that they ruled. And and, um, one of the disappointing things for me um, was not the ruling, though that was disappointing in itself uh, in in a sense. It wasn't as disappointing as what I'm thinking is disappointing because I I saw it coming. Most of you, I think, knew that this was going to happen, that... that, um, at least at some point in my life and in most of your lives, at some point it's going to be this way. We could kind of see it going that way. It happened much quicker than probably most of us could have ever realized. But the disappointing thing for me is the reaction that I've seen from some Christians um, that have taken such strong stands. And um, it, it's good to stand on the truth. The, the, the truth of the matter is that, that our government doesn't define morality. Uh, it never has and it never will. Um, there are lots of things that are legal that our government recognizes as okay or not, not okay uh, that's not moral. Um, one, of the, one of the examples that first comes to my mind is adultery. Uh, most of us would acknowledge that adultery is immoral. Adultery is a sin, and, and God lists homosexuality as a sin, um, a, a behavioral sin just like adultery. Um, but it's not, adultery is not illegal in our country. Adultery is not, it, all, there have been times, I don't know about in our country, I don't think, there have been times throughout the history of the world when adultery was illegal. Um, in fact, one of the things that I think about when I think about these things is, is John chapter 8 where Jesus came upon a situation where there was a woman caught in adultery. And the law of the land was to stone her. Because she had committed adultery, the, the, she was set to die. And these 
uh, men gathered around her with stones. They were ready to stone her. Um, and Jesus reacted in a way that I think we can all learn from, and I think a lot of Christians need to learn from. Jesus acknowledged her sin at the end of John, that story in John chapter 8. Uh, we realize that Jesus acknowledged her sin. He goes and tells her to sin no more. But he also uh, didn't throw stones at her. And I think as Christians, we need to do the best that we can uh, to reflect that kind of attitude that Jesus had to our world. Um, so, so here are a couple things that I want us to remember. Um, our mission as the church has not changed. Nothing, when, when the Supreme Court ruled, nothing about the church's mission changed. We are still called to go and make disciples. And in SEC, we're called to make disciples who make disciples who make some more. And, and I believe that if the church had been doing this for the last 50 or 60 years, that some of these issues that we're, that we're having now wouldn't be happening if the church had really done what the church was supposed to do. Um, and that's, that's on me. Uh, and that's on each and every one of us that are here. Um, so I had some things that I was going to say, and I feel like I've lost those. Uh, we're still, the, the, the church's mission is the same. God is still on the throne. God has not been kicked off the, th the throne. The Supreme Court did not uh, boot him off and put themselves there. Th that can't happen. God is still in control. The, the United States government is not in control. They have some control because they have some authority here. Um, but God is ultimately in control. And finally, the church is working on, on how to respond. We, it's, it's early. We don't, this is new for us. This is new not only for Snowball Christian Church, but for each and every church that you go to. What is the best way for us to respond? How do we respond? How do we deal with this? How is this going to impact us? What are some possibilities? Um, so we are dealing with that. The elders and I have already had some email conversation about what does this mean for us? How will this impact us? And, and the answer is we just don't know. Um, but we're going to be working on that and, and trying to deal with that as best we can. If you have any questions, comments, you have this thing that you think is so vital, um, then I want you to come talk to us. Um, we're still called to love God and to love people. And if we don't, if, if we don't, if we forget everything else, let's not forget that. The two greatest commandments are still the two greatest commandments. Love God and love people. If you have any thoughts, questions, or comments about that, come see me or come see one of our elders. The, I'm sure they'd be uh, more than willing to talk to you. Okay, now, downshift. You ready? Here we go. That's, that's kind of weird. That's a weird transition. Normally, I try to make transitions smooth where nobody even knows we turned, but we're getting ready to turn sharp here. All right. What do we do? Why do we do what we do? I mean, we, do, we all do stuff, right? I mean, we all have things to do. We have things in our lives. We have jobs. We have work. We have school. We have this. We have that. We have projects. Uh, we have families. We have, why do we do what we do. Why are you married to who you're married to? Why are you? And some of you are thinking, that's a good question. I don't, I don't really know. I, I've been asking myself that same question for a long time. Why do we do what we do? I mean, why do we do anything? Why do you go to school? Why do you get a job? Why do you do what you do? Well, the answer to that question, whether we would acknowledge this all the time or not, the answer to that question is because we're going to get something out of it right? I mean, you married your spouse when you married him or her. At the time, you thought, this is beneficial to me. Now, I know, you know, I'm not even, that's enough of that, right? So, so at the, when you got your job, you thought, this is going to be beneficial to me. When you went to school, you thought, this is going to benefit me. I'm going to gain something from this. And, and ideally, we go to school so that we can get an education, understanding, so that we can get a job. Sometimes people just want to get educated, and that's fine, but that's still gaining something. Why do we do what we do? Well, we do what we do to get something out of it. I mean, that's kind of the point of doing anything for most of us. Now, there are some instances where people are completely selfless. I think about my parents. Uh, I didn't recognize this until uh, I had kids of my own. There are times when parents are completely selfless, where they do stuff not of any benefit of their own only to take care of their child. And what an amazing thing that is. But generally speaking, we only do what we do because it benefits us, because we get something out of it, because we get something from it. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I think that's kind of okay. That's just the way things are. I remember when I was in college at the University of Kentucky, the first time I went to college, if you want to ask me about that, I'll tell you about that. First time I went to college, I was at the University of Kentucky, and I was a, a freshman in college, and I needed a job because Carrie and I were going to get married. And, um, and, and so I started working at a company called Lexmark. Maybe you've heard of them. They make printers. Uh, laser printers was kind of a big, kind of a newish kind of thing back then. That was a long time ago, 1993, long time ago. 
Uh, and so I started working at Lexmark, which had just kind of bought out IBM. I don't really understand how all that happened. I was kind of coming in on the, on the transition period there. There was what it seemed like from my perspective is that the, all of these people that worked at IBM had worked there for like 30 years and they were making lots of money and, the, and these Lexmark people were trying to kick them out. They didn't want to pay these old guys this money. And so what they did is for a tenth of the price or probably even less than that, they hired a bunch of us college punks, you know. So we came in there and we're doing their job and they're trying to motivate us. We're not hardly making anything compared to what the IBM guys had made for years. And so to, to help keep us there, to keep us from, you know, training us and then running off and finding another job, they tried to motivate us. And so they would do these things and, they, you know, say good things to us and, hey, congratulate, we're so happy you're here. And they always kind of kept this upbeat thing and it was... It was all part of this thing, this kind of uh, a veil of, you know, keeping up spirits and all this stuff. And, and for a lot of people it worked, and, and for me it worked to some degree. But they called this meeting this one time, I'll never forget this, and I didn't realize how kind of profound I was at the time, but it was kind of, I was just being smart alecky. And um, the, they called us in this meeting, and they were going to ask us, and, and I worked in a little cell, what they called a cell, and they, they had us all in there, and the manager was all rah, rah, everything's going great, and everybody's loving their job, yay, everybody's celebrating. And they said, we want you to know, we want to we know why you're here. So if you would, everybody kind of go around and tell us why you're here. And, and they asked a couple of people, because it's a great place to work, they said they were, they were falling into the, you know, the rah, rah. And they asked me, and I was like second or third, I don't remember, and they said, why are you here? And I said, because you pay me. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here if you didn't. And I think that's the case with most, most of us. I mean, we wouldn't work if we didn't get paid, right? I mean, most of us, maybe some of you have a job that you love and you, you would work without getting paid. We wouldn't go to school if we didn't benefit from it. We don't do what we do for any other reason except because we get something out of it, generally speaking. Not always the case, of course. But generally speaking, we do what we do because we get something from it. And that's part of our, what we're talking about this morning. That's the basis for our myth today. And we're going to look at Christian myth number seven, which is God brings good luck. Christian myth number seven, God brings good luck. Most of you would never admit to believing this. But most of us, at one point in another in our life, at one point or one point or time, at least a few times probably in our life, have thought about this idea that I'm going to follow God to get something from Him. And we believe that following God will bring us good fortune. And perhaps for, for many people, this is why we put our faith in God to begin with. We put our faith in God, we trust in God for the hope that we're going to get something from God. I believe in God in the hopes that my checking account will be bigger. I believe in God in the hopes that my health will stay good. I believe in God in the hopes that my relationship, my, my marriage, my relationship with my friends and family, that all of those things will, will go well. And you can kind of see this, this kind of idea progressing. Uh, unfortunately, many people in ministry, many people who kind of sit in the seat where I am or, you know, you've seen these, these people on TV, many people in ministry perpetuate this idea. All you have to do to be blessed is to send me money. All you have to do to be blessed is to send $300 for my plane. All you have to, that was, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. All you have to do to be blessed is to, to send me stuff or to send the ministry stuff or to send the church stuff. If you give, you're going to get. And so we've kind of fallen into this myth that if, if I do, if I kind of have a little bit of God, then I'm going to get something from it. We kind of get this idea is, is if we believe, we have to give. And if we believe, then we're going to receive from God. And people believe this lie. And there's some serious consequences to believing this lie. When you believe the myth that you're going to get something for following God, that you're going to be blessed in a certain way, like my checking account's going to get bigger, or my relationships are going to be better, or whatever, and then that doesn't happen, then what happens? Well, then you turn away from God. Because why follow a God who you hope to get something from, who's not kind of living up to your end of the bargain, at least in terms of your ideas of what God is and what he's about. I mean, think about it. If, if you follow God to get something, health, wealth, good fortune, and he doesn't do it, why follow God at all? And I think lots of people kind of buy into this myth. Lots of people buy into the idea that if I just follow God, I'm going to get something from God, I'm going to be blessed, and God will give me stuff, and everything will work out okay. But when their life is still a wreck, well, they don't know where to turn. And this is not a new phenomenon. In fact, it's been going on for, for many millennia. 
If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to the book of Job. Uh, Job is uh, maybe hard for you to find. It's kind of almost uh, near the middle of the Bible. If you're going to grab a pew Bible, the one a Bible in front of you is on page 417. 417. If you don't own a Bible, we would love for you to take one of those home with you as a gift from Snellville Christian Church. Now, for those of you who know the story about Job, Job was a, was a, actually, most people believe that Job was actually the first book of the Bible written, or at least Job was the, the earliest time. I mean, Job was kind of like this ancient kind of guy, and, and they had this idea uh, that if they believed in God, God good stuff would come to them. And it's kind of the same idea that we have today, a lot of us. And for those of you who don't really know the story about Job, what happened is, is that Satan went to God, and God um, was like, you know, look at my people, and look at my person, Job. Look at Job. What a great man he is. He follows me, and Satan says, you know what? If he wasn't so blessed, he wouldn't follow you. He, and Satan kind of asked permission of God to let me kind of test this. And so what Satan did is he uh, wiped out Job's property, all of his cattle and livestock, all of these things died. And not only did he wipe out his property, but all of Job's children died. All ten of the children died. And Job still, in fact, if you look at Job chapter 1, verse 20, this is kind of after all this happened. It says, then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground. And we expect to read that he cried out to God in anguish that all of this bad stuff had happened. Why, God? Why? But it doesn't. It says, Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I come from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. And so Satan's plan was kind of thwarted. He thought, well, if I'm going to do all of this bad stuff to Job, Job is going to curse God and turn his back on God and, and probably, uh, you know, just, just take people with him, right? Kind of what we expect to happen in our society. In fact, if you look at uh, Job chapter 2, verses 4 through 8, we read this, then Satan answered the Lord, skin for skin, all that a man has he will give for his life, but stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. Basically, what Satan was saying is if you make Job sick, if you affect his health, Job is going to curse you. Verse 6 says, And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, only spare his life. Basically, God was saying, Do whatever you want, just spare his life. So Satan went out, to the, went out of the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he, talking about Job, and he took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. What a miserable existence. After Job lost his, all of his earthly wealth and after his children died, now he has these sores on his body from head to toe that were so nasty that he took a piece of pottery and he's scraping it out. What a disgusting and, and just terrible existence. And so the question would be, why would we, is what people would ask Job is, if you're following God and all of this bad stuff is happening, why follow God at all? I mean, if your life is a wreck, why not just turn your back, curse God, and be done with it? I mean, it's easy to follow God when things are going good, but when things are going bad in your life, what then? In fact, look at verse 9 there. Then his wife, Job's wife, said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. His wife bought into the lie that God brings good luck. Another example of this in the Old Testament is, is uh, from a man named Asaph. Uh, Asaph was, had written some of the Psalms. Uh, in fact, we'll be in Psalm 73 if you want to flip over there. Go ahead and flip over there because we're going to uh, look at a little bit of Psalm 73. It's on page 485 in the Pew Bible. Go ahead and flip over there. Psalm 73, we're gonna, uh, at the end of the message, we're going we're gonna to come back to that. But Asaph was a worship leader. Um, he was a worship leader, kind of led choir. He was, the, he was the Dean Lancaster of King David's choir. Uh, I'm, he wasn't as talented as Dean, I'm sure. That's Kind of got quiet there real quick, didn't it, Dean? That's right. Um, but uh, King Asaph was a worship leader, not unlike Dean, and he was in King David's choir, and he wrote several psalms, including this one in Psalm 73. Uh, and I want to read you just a few verses there. Uh, Psalm 73, verse 1 says, A psalm of Asaph, Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. And we kind of expect that, right? To those people who are pure in heart, those people who follow God, uh, we expect God to be good to them. Verse 2, But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant 
when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. And basically what Asaph is saying is, wait a minute. I'm following God and yet my life isn't as good as those people who aren't. I'm following God and yet I have troubles, I have problems, I have all of these things going on. And here these people who are following God are, are, are they're fat and they're sleek. They're, they got all of this good stuff going for them. They don't have the same troubles that I have. Asaph's problem was kind of like what many of us have. If I'm going to follow God, shouldn't I get something out of it? Shouldn't something good come from that? And, and Asaph looks at the world and he says, none of these people are following God and yet they're flourishing. And God hasn't helped Asaph at all. Have you ever had moments like that? Moments in your life where your life is a wreck and you're thinking, man, what is going on? Surely I thought following God would deliver me from some of these things. Moments like Asaph here or like, like Job's wife where you say, forget it. Forget it. If I'm going to follow God and my life is still going to be a mess, I ought to just go on doing whatever I want to do. And we think about ourselves and we... We kind of place ourselves in God's shoes, right? And we say, if I, if I were God and I, I saw me following God, I would, I would bless me. If I were God and I saw you following God, I would bless you. I, I wouldn't let the, the, those who are not following God flourish while, while those who are following God struggle and suffer. And, and if I were God, I would do these things. And, and if I would do these things, wouldn't God do these things? And shouldn't God do these things? I mean, what happens is, is that people struggle with this. They struggle with this idea. And what happens is they begin playing this religious game. Most of you know what I'm talking about, right? The religious game. Where you at least publicly pro proclaim the, uh, or maybe you or your friends public pro publicly proclaim your great admiration for God. And it's not a game that you, that you necessarily have to play in private. In private, you can kind of do whatever you want. But in public, you, you, you put out this idea, this persona, like you're following God. Uh, and you do that to, to get more money or to have a better social life or to, to meet the right person. And I don't know if you know the rules of the game, but the rules of the game are pretty simple. Please God enough to get what you want. Pretty simple rules. And unfortunately, I found myself playing this game, and probably most of you have as well. And you play this game in public where you're pleasing God and you're serving and you're doing all in the hopes that people see you and that God sees you because if God sees you, then you're going to get something from Him. In the New Testament, the Pharisees did this. In fact, Jesus condemned them for this. They had their family histories. You know, they would, they would roll out this scroll and they would say, here's where I come from and here's how I'm a descendant of Abraham. And they had their, their sacrifices and they had their, their, their fancy shawls and they had their big long prayers that they prayed on the street corner for all to hear. They were playing the religious game. And they did all of these things with the idea that if they did these things, that God would bless them. And if they didn't do these things, then God would not bless them. And we do it too. So many of us. We do it too. You know, we do the, the, the Catholic cross. You've done that, right? Maybe not. But you've seen people who have. Uh, you probably haven't kneeled to, to pray in the end zone after scoring a touchdown, but, but we've seen people who have done that. Or you, many of you have done this though, right? You, you get the biggest Bible you can find and you put it on your coffee table for all to see. You never touch it. You never really open it. In fact, it's really just a decoration. But it's good to have it there. These are the rules of the religious game. I joke with my mom and dad. I, I, um, I, I was there at their house this week because we were up in Kentucky and I, I was at their house and uh, I was like, where are the, they got some coffee cups that have scripture on them. I was like, where are the scripture cups, you know? Get those out when your Christian friends come over. And they were, but it, you know, they're not. And then my dad's going to listen to this. Dad, I'm sorry, I wasn't making fun of you. They don't, they don't do that. But a lot of us do. We do these kind of things to play this game. 
It's almost like we, we, we think that we're smarter than God, and God is so dumb that if I put on this mask and play these games, if, you know, if, I, if I cross myself or I put my Bible on the table or I do these things, th then God is going to be fooled into think that I'm really following Him. And if He thinks I'm following Him, then He's going to give me some good stuff. And if we combine enough God in our lives... You know, we've got a little God here. It's kind of like baking a cake. We've got a little God here. We've got a little life here. And we kind of mix those things together. And man, our checking account's bu busting out. Or our relationships are great. And we, all because we mixed our life with a little bit of God. And I read a, a post from a guy that I went to high school with this week on Facebook. This was before the Supreme Court thing, you know, dominated your Facebook feed. But, but I, I read a post from a, from a guy that I went to high school with. And I don't really know him that well. I didn't even know him that well in high school. But... Um, he was talking about, I don't know what happened in his life, but something good happened in his life. And he was just saying, hey, I want to thank God. And he was, it was really good. And, and I was like, oh, that's really, really cool. And he gets to the bottom and, and he says, it just goes to show that when you trust God, karma will work out for you. And I thought to myself, does he not realize those two things are, are mutually exclusive? They don't, they don't go together. And in fact, karma is the idea that you get what you deserve. Uh, faith in Christ and, and trusting in God is the opposite of that. We get what we don't deserve. In fact, if karma were true, Christ would have never died on the cross. He didn't deserve it. And so what I recognize with this man, this young, 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 this young guy who I graduated high school with, <laughs> is that what he had done is he had taken what we're talking about here. He'd taken a little bit of God and a little bit of karma and he'd taken his life and he kind of mixed those things up and, and he thought that whatever good happened in his life came about because of that. And it's all based on this Christian myth that, that if we trust God, good stuff will happen. It's kind of like, like Paul in, in Acts chapter 17. Uh, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with that, what happens is that Paul is in Athens and he goes to Greece and he's in Athens and he's walking along and, and everywhere he goes he sees a statue and another statue and another statue and another statue and all of these gods along the way and I don't really know what the gods were but I'm imagining like uh, the god of fertility and the god of rain and the god of this and the god of that and he's walking along the way and he comes to this one and it just says to the unknown god. And, and, and Paul is eventually he's like, you know, you've got this unknown god and let me tell you about him. And he begins to tell him about God. But what th their idea was is that we don't want, we want to make sure we don't miss one. We want to make sure that we've got sprinkled in our life enough of every God so that all of these gods, and we don't miss enough, and we get them all so that these gods will bless us. And it's this idea that God brings you good stuff if you play the religious game. And Christians do it. Christians buy the t-shirts with the, with the, scripture or the fancy slogans or they you, you've seen the t-shirts where they take a, um, um, a, a normal commercial advertisement and they, they change the words a little bit to make it real fancy you know so they'll sell some Christians do it they play the religious game they buy the t-shirts they put the the ichthus symbols the little, the little fish symbols on their car they serve at church they put money in the plate and all of the, none of those things are wrong in and of themselves but but they so many people do these things in the hope that if I give a little bit to God by serving here or doing that or whatever, then, then God's going to benefit my life in some way. And the truth of the matter is that God has no desire to benefit you. God has no desire to benefit you at all if all you're doing is playing a religious game. In fact, God s saved some of his harshest words for people like that. He says, I would rather you be extremely cold. I'd rather you be completely on the other side of the fence than, than to be lukewarm right here in the middle. He says, for those who are lukewarm, I spit them out of my mouth. And the truth is that so many of us play this religious game hoping to get a little something from God, but God's blessings are so much bigger than we can imagine. And we think about having a bigger checking account or we think about having a, a better relationship with our spouse, but God's blessings are far greater than those. And if you follow God for what he can do for you, hoping your life will be better, you're missing the point. And when we focus on what God can give us in the here and now, man, it's so short-sighted because God's blessings are bigger than that. There's so much more to God's plan for your life than you being healthy. There's so much more to God's plan for your life than you being wealthy. There's so much more to God's plan for your life than everything running smooth or you being comfortable. These things are all good, and there's nothing wrong with these things in and of themselves, but those should be the least of our concerns. We've got to watch out 
for people who say, follow God so that you can get something. We've got to watch out for people who say, be positive, have your best life now. Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. There's more to this life than getting stuff from God, to being benefited by God. This world is only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to, to what God has for us. God never promises to make our lives happy. God never promises to make our lives comfortable. That's not really a good sales pitch for those of you who aren't following Jesus, right? But God never promises those things. But at the same time, our lives mustn't be filled with dread and gloom. There are wonderful aspects to following God. Following God's ways are better. That doesn't mean we'll have a better life in terms of the way we look at it. But living as God would have us to live, following Him as, as He's called us to do, can lead us to a better life right here and right now. But it, it's not promised. Can you imagine telling the Christians in the Middle East right now that following God makes their life better? It certainly doesn't. In fact, the opposite is true. Many are running for their lives right now because they follow Jesus. Following God does not always make your life better. And so we've got to focus on what is bigger, much bigger than the right here and the right now. And the biggest part of our lives we can't see. The biggest part of our lives we can't even see. We were created to be eternal. All of us. And if you're a Christian here this morning, if you're a follower of Jesus, then you will see life eternal. And if not, you will experience eternal death. And the second death, as it's called in Scripture. And that's why Asaph in Psalm 73, if you're still there, uh, hold on to that. That's why Asaph, though struggling with this, finally came to the right conclusion. Look at verses 16 and 17 of Psalm 73. He says, but when I thought how to understand this, meaning this idea that, that the bad receive good and the good don't receive good all the time. He said, but when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a, worry, a wearisome task. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. And basically what Asaph is saying is when I looked at the end of the matter, when I looked to what would beyond what we can see right here and right now, when I looked to eternity, I came to the conclusion that, that God's right. That's a, that's a Jonathan add on there. But Asaph would say, I came to the conclusion that I still need to trust and follow God. As Christians, we still need to trust and follow Jesus when things don't go our way. When our lives are a wreck, when our lives are miserable, when our lives are all messed up, when we're not getting from God like we hoped we might. We need to look to the end, to look to eternity and know that God is in control. He's still on His throne. And until we gain a healthy perspective, until we gain a perspective with eternity in mind, we'll probably continue to struggle with what we're getting from God. But here's the, here's the conclusion of everything. You want to have a blessed life? Put your trust in Jesus. That doesn't mean your life is going to be smooth. That doesn't mean your life is going to be comfortable. That doesn't necessarily mean that everything is just going to be wonderful and you're going to see, you know, lollipops and unicorns and float on clouds. Following Jesus is hard. But we get eternity. We're blessed for eternal life. Now in a moment, we're going to sing a song and we kind of have this uh, conclusion every week where we have an opportunity for you to respond to the message. And um, So I, I'm going to ask you, as we think about this, in a moment we're going to stand during the song and, and sing. And, and while you're standing and singing, I, I want you to think about yourself and your life, not your friends or your family or people you know that struggle with this, but, but where are you personally? Have you struggled with this idea of playing the religious game? Just maybe if I go to church or if I serve, if I give, God's going to bless me. If so, then my, my prayer for you is that you look beyond that and look to the bigger picture. Maybe you're struggling with understanding why is it that if I follow God, all of these people are blessed and I'm not. Look to the big picture. If you're not trusting in Jesus, if you haven't put your trust and your faith and hope in Him to save you from your sins, then, then my prayer is that today you will do that. Let's pray. Father, I love you and I praise you and I thank you for your word. 
And Lord, we have, have fun with these Christian myths and saying seriously and those kind of things, but this is serious. This is understanding the difference between just playing religion and, and following Jesus. And so, Lord, I pray that today we would get our hearts right. We would focus our hearts and minds on eternity. And, Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here who hasn't put their trust in following Jesus that today, they would do that. Let me tell them what that means and what that looks like and help raise them up. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.